So can you hear me? I'd have to stand on my toes. <laughs> Just down. I can't. I can't speak very loud. There we go. Tan Doreen Burgum Dishinikashan, Olds Otetan, Nipapa Ambrose Dishinikashan, Métis Le Femelle Boudreau Dumont, Nimama Mary Dishinikashan, Métis Le Femelle um, Dufresne Van Ness. My grandfather, uh, Daniel Van Ness, was born in Calgary July 19th. 1885, and my great grandparents, Baptiste and Catherine Van Ness, homesteaded on Section 15, where the Saddle Dome sits today. That was their property, and then they lost it to Scrip, of course. And um, so the Van Ness side of the family and the Dumont side of the family have been in the Calgary area for for a long time. So I'll do the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge Treaty 7 territory, the traditional ancestral territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai, Bikani, and Sisika, as well as Sutina Nation, and Stony Nakoda First Nation. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the new Ote Pemsuak Metis Government, District 5 and District 6. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Metis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make we make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. And I'm going to share my Four Directions prayer with you. So I'll ask you to stand and face the east direction. <clears throat> God, our creator, we thank you for guiding our leaders and elders to finally get recognized as the Métis Nation in our Canada. God, our creator, we thank you for giving this day, giving us this day to spend time together. Today we stand tall with gratitude and great pride in the spirit and footsteps of our ancestors. God, our creator, we first acknowledge the east direction, the direction of the sunrise and new beginnings. The east is the direction of the child. So we pray for the youth of the world. Help our youth find the balance between past and present in tradition and spirit. We pray for all the First Nations, Métis and Inuit children found in the cemeteries at residential schools. We acknowledge the white race that it represents. I'll ask you to turn to the south. God, our creator, we now acknowledge the south direction, the direction of summer warmth and abundance. South is the direction of the woman, and we honor them as the gateways through which our spirits come to earth. We ask that women everywhere be protected, for they are sacred. We acknowledge the color yellow and the yellow race that it represents. <clears throat> we'll turn to the west. God, our creator, we next turn to the west direction, the direction of the setting sun and the autumn season. West is the direction of the elders, and we honor our, our elders as the keepers of wisdom and teachers of patience. West is also the direction of our ancestors, and we proudly acknowledge those who have gone before us. We acknowledge the color red and the red race it represents. We'll turn to the north. God, our creator, we now turn to the north, the direction of the winter that covers the earth. North is the men's direction, 
and we honor men as the providers and protectors of the family and the nation. We acknowledge the color black and the black race it represents. God, our creator, we ask our creator to be with us today. We also pray for peace among the four races of humankind. Merci and detran and un. Thank you so much, Doreen, for that wonderful prayer. Uh, before we get started, I just want to quickly outline uh, the sequence of events. So the lecture will last for about 50 minutes, and then there will be time for questions, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. And after the public lecture, um, there will also be a time, a, a moment for uh, Thanksgiving. And then um, after the public lecture, our speaker has kindly invited all the students in the audience to stay on and to have a special seminar with, uh, with him. So if you are a student and you would like to stay on for this special seminar at the end of the uh, talk, please uh, come to me and identify yourself. Thank you. So uh, we are here for the occasion of the Bentall Lecture in Education and Theology co-hosted by the Calgary Public Library and the Chair of Christian Thought. This endowed lecture is in memory of Dr. Howard Bentall and Dr. Shirley Bentall. Uh, uh, Howard Bentall had, distinguished, had a distinguished career in the ministry, uh, in the Baptist tradition. His ministries included Walmer Road Baptist Church in Toronto and First Baptist Church in Calgary. For many years, he was the honorary director of Operation Eyesight Universal, an international organization working to eliminate avoidable blindness and restore eyesight. He was secretary treasurer of the Hawthorne Charitable Foundation, which supports charities serving humanitarian and social needs, both nationally and internationally. Shirley Bentall was president of the Baptist Union of Western Canada from 1976 to 1977. And uh, she was the first president of the Canadian Baptist Federation from 1985 to 1988. In retirement, she was involved in the creation of the Salisbury Community Society in East Vancouver a housing initiative that cultivates community diversity and provides support for refugees. The Bentall spent their last years founding the Rivendell Retreat Center on Bowen Island. The volunteer-run retreat values prayer, silence, simplicity, and hospitality, and offers a welcome to people seeking renewal, respite, and growth, and is accessible to people with limited resources and social needs. So it is a privilege to hold an annual lecture in education and theology in honor of the Bentals. Now this year's presenter of the Bentall Lecture in Education and Theology is Dr. Paul L. Garreau. Dr. Garreau is Métis born and raised in Batak homeland in Saskatchewan. He is an associate professor and associate dean, graduate studies in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. His research and scholarship focus on Métis studies and religious studies, religion and relationality, indigenous knowledge, onto epistemologies, nationhood, peoplehood relations, race, gender, and marginalization, as well as theme-based community-led research. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Garreau to the podium to give this year's Bentles Lecture in Education and Theology. Oh, I think you took my notes. <laughs> a good start to this thing, eh? Holy. <laughs> what a good start to it. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me, eh? To this mic? No? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, right on. Oh, it's squeaking a bit. Okay. Thank you so much for this amazing welcome and an amazing prayer. Thank you very much, Doreen. Um, and thank you for coming today. Uh, 
as as you know, I'm a professor in the Faculty of Native Studies, which is this is our faculty here with the TP and uh, the Red River Cart. Um, and I'm very happy. Uh, and this is one of the first times I'm in Calgary, which is I've driven through, you know, lots of times, um, but I've never actually come in and like, you know, explored and actually settled and took a look at things, right? So a beautiful day, a beautiful cold day to be here. So uh, merci very much for, for coming today and uh, your warm welcome. So, Tanshi Kiwao, um, a bana pramiji. Mm, that's some machif there. Bana pramiji. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Garo, uh, Pagaro uh, de Shinika Ashwan. Um, again, thank you for the acknowledging Treaty 7 of Blackfoot, uh, uh, Nakoda, and Tutsina, uh, these confederacies, amazing confederacies who live in this place, as well as uh, recognizing District 5 and 6, the uh, Nose Hill Metis District, and Elbow Metis District, in which we are intersecting here, uh, of the Otipimsuak Métis government of the MNA. I am Métis or Michif. I'm born and raised in the village of Bellevue, uh, Saskatchewan, which is really good. <laughs> there you go, right on. Not many people know where that is, so thank you if you do know, that's fantastic. Um, my family names or Métis family names are Jobin, Bremner, and Taylor. Uh, my mom is French-Canadian, my dad is Michif. And he actually spoke Michif French, and we grew up with that language. And sometimes when you met with Francophones, they would be like, what's wrong with your language? <laughs> you know? So these are the kinds of like, you know, growing up that we did as Métis, growing up in a French Canadian village in the Métis uh, homeland of Batoche, an important place, right? Um, I'm an associate professor and newly minted associate dean of graduate studies, which is why I have so much gray hair now. <laughs> Too much stress, I guess. Um, so uh, in uh, the Faculty of Native Studies um, in, uh, at the University of Alberta in Miskwachiwa, Skygan, which is also the White Mud uh, district, of, uh, district number 10. So these are all new districts in which we're learning about, right? And we're very excited about our new Otepimsuak government. Um, as, as Carolyn said, I am an Indigenous Studies and a Religious Studies scholar, and I'm also a husband and a uh, father to two rambunctious little boys. So you might see them online. If you look very closely, you might see them like playing around in the bush. So again, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carolyn, for, uh, for this warm welcome and this really uh, amazing opportunity, a rare opportunity to present my research and just present Indigenous Studies in general and what that links to Religious Studies. So um, the Chair of, uh, of, of Christian Thought in the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, uh, the Calgary Public Library, for hosting this event. This is a beautiful space. Um, I'm amazed. And uh, finally, uh, Elder Doreen uh, Burgum for a beautiful, thoughtful prayer. Merci. Said thanks twice, eh? That's good. Um, so the title of my talk is called Critical Indigenous Theory and the Study of Religion. That is a super lofty title, <laughs> lofty idea. So let's see if it's understandable. I don't know if it makes sense or what, you know. So, um, so this talk, uh, and this is where it kind of gets a little bit interesting because um, for me, this is a intersection of, of academic and, and community and public, right? So how do you present uh, to the public and how do you present to in, in academia indigenous experiences, thoughts, you know, ways of being, right? Um, how do you understand kinship? So this, is, this challenge here also re represents the challenge we have as Indigenous Studies folks, right? So, um, so this talk is based on an article that I co-wrote with a brilliant Métis scholar and activist, Molly Swain. Uh, Molly is a PhD student in the Faculty of Native Studies who is born and raised in Calgary. And uh, what is it? Uh, 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 um, what's the name for Calgary? I got it right here. Mokinsis, thank you, right on. See, it's all good. <laughs> so she was uh, born and raised in uh, Okimsis and is currently living in Whitehorse, Yukon. And this article uh, that we co-wrote for, for this presentation is called Indigenous Knowledges and will soon be published uh, by Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Religion, which is a really rare thing for this little machif boy from Batash to be writing for Oxford, which is, and Molly for writing for Oxford. Um, and also, how does Indigenous knowledges intersect with religion? So this is a thought experiment. Um, also, too, I invite you when it comes out to read the article. It's only 10,000 words. Put it in your car, just drive and listen to it. Who knows, right? Um, so... So this presentation symbolizes the kind of work we do at the Faculty of Native Studies. 
Um, so faculty native studies and you know, just to, so you know, it's the only standalone faculty in North America uh, representing Indigenous studies disciplinarity outside of departmental structures. So there are a lot of departments of Indigenous studies all over North America, all over Turtle Island, but uh, the faculty of Native studies, our faculty is the only standalone one. So we're very interdisciplinary as well as disciplinary work. So it's a really uh, dynamic and amazing place to work and to think and to be, right? Um, so we're very proud of this work and how we make relations in the prairies as well as across the globe. Like my boss, Chris Anderson, sees himself as a parkland scholar. And I am so happy to have a boss who sees himself as a parkland scholar. I love that. I feel like I'm a parkland scholar because my thinking comes from this place, right? So Indigenous studies <clears throat> is more than just seeing Indigenous cultures and ways of being as an object of study. We think with our relatives Right? We think in storied places with different nations who are human and other than human. We navigate multiple and situated truths, and we frame our critical engagements with settler society and global forces through collective knowledges and diplomatic relations. So in settler society, <clears throat> as, well as, the, as, as well as academia, Indigenous studies is often misunderstood or dismissed as not relevant to contemporary critical scholarship which is something that we talk about we, that happens all the time. Even Chris, I'll keep talking about Chris, he got asked from a professor um, in our, our university, could you do a, a class on, on Indigenous something, something? It's like, I'm the dean. You know, it's just like, a, you know, like, how do you see me as a serious person, right? How do you see me as a, as a, serious, uh, a serious discipline, right? Um, there's a sort of cognitive dissonance where Indigenous knowledges cannot exist uh, within modern or contemporary society. And this is something that's like a settler colonial, settler society issue, right? Indigenous peoples lose, it's like the, the cognitive dissonance or the, th the thinking is that Indigenous peoples lose a part of themselves to an assimilative force of settler colonialism. Like that if you are in the academy, you're losing yourself. If you are talking in these places, you're losing yourself, right? Um, or Indigenous peoples do not have the capacity for modern critical thought, or worse of all, uh, there are no Indigenous people left, which is sometimes an attitude people have, right? So the role of Indigenous studies is to generate language, concepts, and critiques that help articulate relational logics, right? So this is a very important sort of like way that we think through our discipline and how Indigenous folks think in their communities, right? So our role as Indigenous studies academics is to be better relatives to think with. Be a good cousin to think with critically, right? Um, so my work focuses on, so specifically my work as a religious studies scholar, focuses on the indigenous experiences of religion and spirituality. And I focus my time on our community, on our nation, the Métis Nation, right? Um, I want to see how religion engages indigenous co-constitutive relations and critique racialized identity, right? Focusing on kinship. And as you'll see, I'll spend a lot of time talking about indigenous studies theory than delving into religious perspectives. But don't let that fool you. This indigenous perspectives, indigenous no, notion and uh, knowledges are linked to religion. Religious languages is, is sort of like embedded in all of that, right? But I think what I want to come uh, to sort of convey is a way to discern and sort of like interpret interpret relational logics in that language, in those ideas, right? So for people who are from communities, from church communities and stuff, open, um, be open to the idea that this is a great sort of like, uh, sort of approach to thinking through relatives and relations, right? Um, so, uh, so I won't be speaking too much about religion, but it's religion is everything, right? So, um, so I hope that this work will really sort of land with everyone in the room, you know, either you're indigenous or non-indigenous, uh, person of color, uh, a BIPOC, you know, like um, people who are ch church people, people who are not. Like, I hope that this becomes a great reflection on um, what it means to be good relatives with indigenous folks, right? So, and as I stand before you, I want to make sure that you know that I am not an expert, right? Uh, the material insight from this presentation is all based on Indigenous studies um, uh, and community knowledges. And what me and Molly did was just bring it together in a, in a form or in a way that's like usable, you know? Because it's like after so many years of doing Indigenous studies, you could see how there's all these different aspects from the knowledge that we have to bring them together into this framework. So 
And I want to recognize that I'm a guest to this territory and acknowledge the deep thinking that Indigenous nations and confederacies have done here in this place and in these territories for time immemorial, right? So, and this is an important part of our territorial acknowledgement. And I'm happy that we did a territorial acknowledgement before. Thank you very much. Merci. Um, hi, hi. Um, we cannot possess peoples and places. Their knowledges and ways of being. Indigenous nations and communities have always thrived in overlapping territories with other collective nations that are human and more than human or other than human. Across Turtle Island, countless generations have lived with lands and waters in distinct ways in storied places with diverse relations. And in these places, Indigenous knowledges are informed by being and thinking in relations with others rather than being and thinking alone. So these are the sort of like dif distinctions that we have to make in, in this place, right? Settler colonialism, however, continues to present really complex challenges to Indigenous knowledges, often impeding the self-determination of these relations, right? Um, and this problem is of dispossession regarding Indigenous sovereignty, right? Dispossession meaning that, like, getting in the way of how these relations work and operate and engage, right? Um, and settler colonial possessiveness, or we'll talk a lot about possessiveness in this, in this lecture, drives the misrecognition or, so two things, or the extraction of Indigenous lands, bodies, and knowledges, right? So the outcome of this possessiveness is that Indigenous nations often get reified into categories of race rather than defined by their complex kinship relations. And really, kinship relations is the key to this perspective, right? So in our work, what are the questions that we focus on? How do we uh, focus our understanding on Indigenous experiences, values, and worldview away from settler colonial and Western logics of race and identity towards a presupp presupposition of kinship relations? And in this way, how do we reinterpret the category of religion that we normally have in settler society? Religion looks like this, right? Well, how do how does that how is that changed, mitigated, uh, you know, seen? How do Indigenous folks see religion and define religion? And how do we engage? a critical scholarship that focuses on being a good relative, right? That thinkers can be good relatives, right? And I, as you'll see, I'll put these little uh, marks down so you can, <laughs> I won't be putting lots of notes, but there's a few notes up here, right? So in order to cut through this dominant, the dominant discourse of settler colonialism and Western interpretations of indigenous experience, Molly and I have developed in our paper an interpretive framework we like to call a hermeneutics of relationality, which is, just a sort of a framework, a way of moving forward and understanding Indigenous perspectives. Um, and there's three, so, uh, four categories of this. This is how we organize it. It could be in different ways. For us, uh, we organize it in terms of four different components of this hermeneutic approach. Relationality, onto-epistemologies, density over difference, and nationhood peoplehood, right? Um, and in this presentation, I will unpack that in and you know, look at these things. Um, we see this as a generalizable framework to highlight the veracity of indigenous knowledges while asserting the self-determination de de uh, of indigenous relating, right? And this is an important part of our discipline is that theory is a great way is to help us think through things, right? We need theory and methodology to be able to like go out into the world and think about these things, to think through experiences and our observations, right? So what I'm offering and me and Molly are offering is a framework in which to start to see and understand indigenous experiences as relational, right? So it's a we offer a critical tool to read the central role of relations, situated knowledges in storied places, the relevancy of indigenous knowledges to contemporary thinking and acknowledge the collective aspect of identity. Now, um, the reason too why we did this is because there's so much, there's so many issues, especially right now, with questions of race shifting and possessiveness of indigenous knowledges and things like Buffy St. Marie, Carrie Barassa, Joseph Boyden. We have, this is in the news all the time of pretendians or fate, as we <laughs> called Joseph Boyden, um, fake matey. Uh, so this, these sort of like things are like, why did this happen? What's going on? And in Indigenous studies, we're like, well, yeah, there's this sort of like logics that go through this that have to do with race and identity in which, you know, settlers can just become Indigenous, like Grey Owl, right? Um, so f this for us seems like a really important framework to then deploy to, so that you can say, oh, then what were the elements that were in their identity, in their perspectives, in their stories, right? And hopefully this will be, give you a sort of a delineation of what that looks like. So um, 
Yeah, so the way that we did this is to mitigate these possessive logics that inform race shifting or, you know, all these kinds of possessive things in order to be more responsive and uh, good relatives, right? So the first component is relationality, and this is a theory of kinship relations. It, uh, uh, Eileen Morton Robinson called it a, pre, a key presupposition. That means that in any theory or methods that you're doing, any work you're doing with Indigenous folks, or when you look at communities, relationality is the base, right? It is the baseline. Um, relationality is everything. Uh, Standing Rock Dakota scholar of Ayn Deloria Jr. Call, uh, says relationality represents the concept of a personable universe, so a personable universe, a universe that is shares connections and it is a person. And this is something that you must approach in a personal manner, i.e. Uh, the Cree and Métis ethos, all my relations, while go to win, uh, which is, uh, this is the treaty bear uh, on the University of Alberta campus, uh, which has on it, we are all related, right? the expression of a central piece of Métis and uh, Nahiwak, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, right? That we are all related, so what does that mean, right? So the ethical motivation, therefore, is to make kin. So making kin, not kim, kin. <laughs> you never you hear me, Kim? Um, and because uh, Sisseton Dakota Kim, uh, Professor Kim Talmer says, defines kinship as making peoples into familiars in order to relate, which is a really beautiful thing. It's not just like your blood relative. It's not just uh, another human, but it's these other people around you that you relate to, and you make relations with in order to you know, be connected and be related. Ultimately, this philosophical and ethical orientation of relatedness is a core concept to Indigenous studies in Indigenous communities. So spirituality is a concept that is often used uh, to articulate this philosophical and sociopolitical relatedness, right? Spirituality is the first thing we say when it comes to Indigenous, we call it Indigenous spirituality, right? We never call it Indigenous religions, you know, because I'm spiritual but not religious. Religion has too much baggage to be associated with indigenous, these indigenous relations, right? Um, so spirituality is also linked to metaphysics, which is conventionally understood in Western terms as subjective, relativistic, cultural opinions rather than objective, rational, and empirical truth. So in the article that me and Molly wrote, we get into more detail of the issues of Western thought and stuff and how objectivity and like all of these different enlightenment values sort of like impede um, so many ways of understanding kinship and understanding relations. It's not that it's the opposite. It's just a matter of unpacking what that, what that means for Indigenous folks, right? So... Um, because what it is is that these kinds of dichotomies lead to this Western prejudice that sees Indigenous knowledges as wholly metaphysical uh, without objectivity, right? So they're superstitious, arcane, primitive. This is a discourse of civilization that we are constantly dealing with, right? Um, and um, have been dealing with for a long time. So Deloria uh, claims that what he calls an American Indian metaphysics is, quote, simply that first set of principles that we must possess in order to make sense of the world in which we live. So metaphysics is an important aspect. We can't deny it. We can't push against it. It's just a part of our everyday life, right? So then how do we unpack that, those pejorative understandings of indigenous ways of being annoying, right? Um, it represents a, so these metaphysics represent a holistic and permeable way Indigenous nations and communities engage in a personable universe that is what he says, not fragmented, sterile, or emotionless, right? Sometimes objectivity leads to this idea of like, we must be separate from that. There can't be any overlap. There's too much that leads to like nepotism and all these things, right? So it leads to not being objective, right? Um, so this personal universe that holds, this personable universe holds all of your relations, all of our relations, human and other than human, living or dead. So this is an important place to think in, right? So let's see how that, how we can think in those places, right? Um, and a way of pushing back against this dichotomy between religion and secular, right? Which is a dominant part of modern society as well, right? So one thing with spirituality, it's, it's everywhere. It's something that we talk about, but David Delgado Shorter, a brilliant uh, scholar from the US, a, pure, a person of color scholar, warns that spirituality seems like the better choice to support indigenous knowledges, but it's prone to conceptual slippage, right? It is not a perfect 
idea because of all of this sort of like Western thinking that goes behind it, how it's defined, right? Because um, spirituality is also based on Cartesian binary logics uh, of mind, body, representing the difference between rationalism, empiricism, and metaphysics. So all of these ways of thinking sort of get also bound in spirituality. You know, even though we want spirituality to represent, you know, indigenous relations and metaphysics and a personable universe, they still are informed by this, right? And we see that implicitly. Um, so the way that he he talks about, Shorter talks about in terms of these logics of scientific understanding of spirit and nature, which include objectivity versus subjectivity, natural sciences versus sciences of the mind, and the difference between ethical religion and natural religion. So and this is a modern discourse that we've inherited, right? So... How do, we, how do we deal with that? So indigenous nations are then seen as objects of study within these knowledge powers, uh, circular logics, and then misrecognized as being embodied, natural, subjective, rather than the beautiful object, ethical, empirical, and objective, you know? So we see these dichotomies where one is lower and one is higher. So what he does as a rejection of that Cartesian principle, I think, therefore, I am, Shorter writes a, a really weird, a really great, not weird, a great articulation, we relate, therefore, we are, which I absolutely, I really love that. I think that's a great articulation as a way of not just, not pushing against that Cartesian articulation, but a way of sort of shifting our brains, right, our paradigms to seeing what relations are. Right? So it's a very provocative statement that disrupts the sort of like centrality of thought and the anthropocentrism, the human centrism and individualism of modern Western epistemologies or thinking that focuses on uh, indigenous knowledges. Right? So Shorter sees that there's way too much baggage with spirituality. He just wants to dump it. He's like, I just want to break up with spirituality. We can't date anymore. You know, so... So he argues for a shift, an ontological shift towards intersubjectivity or interrelatedness that, quote, emphasizes mutual connectivity, shared responsibility, and interdependent well-being, which is, makes sense, right? That's what relations are. It's about being responsible to your relatives, connected, and uh, interdependent, right? Um, so, so this intersubjectivity is a base on kinship relations that does not conform to modern definitions of what identity is regarding blood, DNA, genealogical descent, race, gender, sexuality, social groups, or national or state affiliations. Like these are the things that my colleagues are writing about. Kim Talbert has written a lot on and art, you know, a lot of public uh, scholarship on DNA, right? And the sort of biological determinism of that for indigenous folks, which doesn't land very well, right? So, so then how do we define kinship? What is kinship? And I think I, lo I really work a lot with Tall Bear's work because she's very brilliant. And I really, I'm really happy to have her as a colleague. So she describes kin as peoples in alliance with reciprocal responsibilities to one another and to our other than human relatives who, with whose land, waters, and animal bodies we are co-constituted. So co-constitution is an important aspect of this. That means we are not alone in the world. As, as indigenous folks, we are constituted by our relatives. And those relatives are human and other than human. They're, they are our ancestors. They are creator beings. Like all of these different aspects make up who we are. That's co-constituted identity, right? So kin are persons made into familiars in order to relate, right? They are constituted by relations and not possessed by each other. So in that, you cannot or you try not to possess each other, you know? Let yourself be free to, you know, be free, right? So uh, Shorter sees these uh, kinship relations that cannot be described through definitions of spirituality, um, and spirituality cannot describe the complexity of relations. However, don't think that I'm just going to dump all this stuff. It's like, yeah, Shorter was right. Let's get rid of spirituality. Stop talking about it, okay? No more talking about spirituality. Um, however, I found this really great uh, scholar who was talking about math which is really fun. So like relations and math. Her name is Rochelle uh, Gutierrez. Gutier so she's a person of color. She's a Mesoamerican uh, and provides a really significant point of discussion to the idea of spirituality. And she says, understanding spirituality is not as a counterpoint to organized religion and Western institutional thinking, but quote, referring to the various ways people see unity in all things and draw traditional healing and remake ourselves, right? So there's an action there in that term. And it's good to be reminded that, right? Uh, 
Um, and this perspective reflects Deloria's understanding of American Indian metaphysics and Talbert's understanding of an ethos of making kin, right? And that these are spiritual actions, right? And Gutierrez sees it as a spiritual turn, as reconnection of dispossessed relations driven by ethical responsibility between collective communities. So this spiritual turn, you'll become more of a parent in the talk that I'm talking about. But what it is important to say is that spirituality in these contexts has a action aspect, right? It's about turning to our relatives and making those relations happen, right? Um, and these, this spiritual turn is based on lived collective experiences of multiple relations that mobilize socio-political socio actions. And she calls it spiritual activism, right? So that we engage each other. And that's our orientation to make kin is making space and showing up and, and uh, engaging in seeing each other and being with each other, right? So in order to recognize a living, personable, and cohes co cohesive universe, we must focus on how relationality is operationalized or it's made use of terms like spirituality and metaphysics to represent the collective and co-constitutive nature of indigenous knowledges, right? So we can keep terms like metaphysics, we can keep terms like, like religion, like, well, spirituality, and then we have to unpack what religion means. But if when indigenous folks are using these terms, we have to understand what is the relational logics that inform that language? Is it based on Western definitions of structure and institution? You know, is it delineated this way or is it done in a different way, right? So is it like this or is it like this, right? So this, these are the kinds of things that we're, hopefully this hermeneutics helps us sort of confront, right? Um, and it's a challenging the substance of a definition over changing its form. So really it's about challenging that substance and not having to change the forms of these definitions, right? And so in other words, how do we reinterpret religion and spirituality through relationality rather than through institutionalization? Right. And that's been my work and challenge forever. And people have been studying indigenous religions forever. It's like anthropology was based on religion, right? It's like forever and ever and ever. This is new, you know? But for me as a, as a Métis person, it's always been challenging to be in those circles, to be like, what is religion? Oh my God, it's hard to see our relatives in those definitions. Therefore, then it's a paradigmatic issue. It's a paradigm issue, right? So relationality offers uh, this central ethos of experiences, thinking, and being in actions for Indigenous nations to be more, like, to do more community-based research. It really is a key uh, presupposition of Indigenous knowledges, right? So the next one that we'll talk about. So on to epistemologies, right? The way to turn towards relations or understanding relations as the basis really helps understand that Indigenous knowledges are never about individuals thinking alone, but nations and communities that are human and other than human, alive and dead, thinking together and with each other, right? So that's the idea of thinking in, uh, in good relations, right? So again, indigenous knowledges are based on relationality and like questions of spirituality and metaphysics, we appreciate how epistemology and ontology based in Western modern rationalist and empirical thinking and binaries uh, serve the, or make it very difficult to see relationality and see how it fits in our modern world, right? Um, so in Western European thoughts, just for people who don't know, epistemology is a theory of knowledge that represents the complex ways to understand the world. Epistemology is defined as a systematic and reasoned discernment that generates justified belief rather and or truth rather distinct from subjective opinion, right? And if you want to understand the difference between these two, just go onto any sort of like YouTube comments or something, you know, you'll see the difference between justified belief and just subjective opinion, right? So this is where the rubber hits the road. Just go to YouTube and go to, uh, go to uh, TikTok, you'll find it there. So this justified belief is furthermore like based on ontological uh, understandings of oneself and the nature of being, right? So epistemology and ontology kind of go together. Um, so for Indigenous folks, uh, indigenous epistemology and ontology um, can be recognized as a holistic and plural concept that we saw as onto-epistemologies, plural, together, right? Um, onto-epistemologies. Uh, so this is the understanding that, um, that uh, beings are shaped by experiential knowledge in traditional stories, uh, places that are distinct, uh, where distinct communities of humans and other than humans interact, intersect, and coexist. So I'll talk about that in a few seconds here. Uh, 
Um, but uh, Vine Deloria, who's another brilliant, uh, you know, uh, scholar of indigenous studies, who did a lot of stuff on religion because he was like a minister's, uh, you know, grew up in the church, uh, American Indian church. He's amazing. Um, sees relationality to inform indigenous knowledges. So the way he sees it as the concept of power and place, right? And he says, quote, power being the living energy that inhabits or composes the universe and place being the relationship of things to each other. All this to say that place where indigenous peoples gather are powerful places. These are important places to think and to recognize, right? And this focuses on the ideals of language and place as a part of understanding those indigenous onto epistemologies. So indigenous knowledges are intergenerational, they're experiential and they're connected to place, right? Um, these are places where collective communities come together to hear and share stories and knowledges, right? Um, Deloria describes these locations of place and power as sacred sites by virtue of drawing nations together and communities together. And if people who don't know where, where is this? The, you, you in the front row, where is this? This is Batash, exactly. This is the place where I grew up. This is St. Antoine, uh, St. Antoine uh, de Padua Church, a really important place uh, for Métis for Métis identity, especially for us in the home, Métis homeland of Batoche. And it's also the place where, uh, the, where we held a resistance against colonial, Canadian colonial uh, sort of in invasion, I guess, or engagement. We were trying to engage with the government. Things didn't happen. Violence ensued. It's a very uh, dark part of our story. Um, but it's, this is a sacred place for us because we keep going back there every year to pray, to dance, to party, to visit, you know, visiting is sacred for indigenous folks. Visit, like if I had a, if I get a t-shirt, it would say visiting is my religion, you know, and it's my dad's religion as well. So maybe I'll sell that on uh, Pinterest or something. <laughs> Just go see my table in the back at the end there. Thank you. So these sacred sites, um, are really important because they draw people together and they also involve humans and other than humans, ancestors and creator beings. Like this place is imbued with spiritual power of our relatives because we remember them. We'll never forget this, this place. We'll never forget our relatives who died in the resistance. My had an, uh, a relative, a Jobin, who died in the resistance. A lot of Métis families do, right? Um, so these places are sacred. We go back to remember and to remember is, you know, to push back that existential crisis of indigeneity, of indigenous things, of forgetting, right? So that's another story. Um, Dion Millian, who's an Athabascan scholar, she explains indigenous epistemologies are practices and disciplines of place and the protocol for relations between peoples, all life spirits and, and forms, entities in that place inhabit in the face of what she calls settler colonial hegemony. Right, the power of settler colonialism to dispossess indigenous folks, to not allow people to visit and to be in these places safely. And this is still an issue. Safely visiting in places that as indigenous folks is a serious, you know, issue to, uh, still today. 20, what are we, 2024? Still a problem, right? So um, what, she, what she calls this is, uh, what we call this is lifeways. Um, she describes uh, sort of five different uh, elements of these epistemologies. So, um, so to understand this, she has five different elements. So these are land-based knowledges, that the land and the waters hold knowledges and relations, that indigenous languages help communicate and frame these knowledges. And indigenous languages are like Cree, like Blackfoot, but also Michif, languages that represent relations, that communicate relations uh, through the language. Ceremony and ritual operationalizes the fact uh, that these knowledges are not discovered but they're experienced together, again, pushing back against that enlightenment vision of discovering knowledge. Um, they're collective engagements from community, so you cannot be alone. It's always about collectivity, about community, and they're key to interpreting this thing. And then there is no one truth, but distinctive communities holding multiple truths. These are really important insights to understand how does, like the, 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 um, the rivers that, that connect here, this is a Pejonan, well, in Cree, this visiting place, this is super sacred place for the Blackfoot in Siksika, that this is a meeting place um, that like Im embed all of these aspects. And, colon and settler colonialism just moves, a city ends up moving there because it's powerful. These are people where they meet here, like Edmonton, Calgary, P Prince Albert, like all over you can see Canada. These meeting places are powerful and they draw in and make these settler colonial cities, right? So it's something to be said about that. Anyways, um, so this is an important 
perspective. Um, so, and then the concept of ontologies for Indigenous peoples is also plural and situated uh, understandings, right? Ontology represents the stories of being, which include time, space, cause, and identity. Stories are everywhere and everything. And we know this about Indigenous folks. Stories are everything, right? The stories we hear that are formal, the stories that we hear from our families, they are super important to us, right? They, they really sort of like, um, they help unpack knowledge, right? They unpack history and futurity, they unpack revelation, they unpack and they confer ritual and ceremony and they, sh they shape cultures and societies. So like relationality and epistemologies, stories, ontologies, shape the ethics of being and the governance of indigenous communities, right? And like, uh, Nahi, uh, so for example, Nehia Cree scholar Rob Innes, an amazing scholar, uh, speaks of the importance of elder brother or the Chicks narratives, or as we can say in winter, Wasaki Jack, we can say that, right? <laughs> we, won't get, uh, we won't get bombarded or nothing. Um, so he sees these, uh, the, the sort of elder brother narrative in his community of Kawasas First Nation as helping sort of navigate the pluralism of their nation, which is a Ojibwe, uh, Plains Ojibwe, Soto, Cree, and Métis community, right? So Wasaki Jack, or the elder brother, really helps navigate the issue, the, the differences that are there. Elder brother helps frame the Nehiwa concept, as I said, Wakotuin, all my relations, through these ontological stories that are ancient and contemporary, inherited and lived, right? Um, and then elder brother also gives substance to governance and collective knowledges, but it also frames uh, philosophical perspectives on how to be a good relative, and how to live a good life, so these are really great elements to understand how you know knowledge is con conveyed, how this happens, but it also happens in these stories and in these places, right? Um, it generates this really, for 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 the for in terms of like these stories, it really helps to generate uh, these states of relational um, co these relational cohesiveness um, and to live in a place with without or mitigated possessiveness, right? So an important part, story is important. Um, and then an important fact that I need to, to unpack too is that of situated knowledges, right? So land-based, experiential, and collective community-based knowledges um, are, uh, are important, right? So um, important uh, in terms of place, like we talked about, um, and for different communities. So the basis for this is what uh, Sean Wilson, who's a Cree scholar, says, relations with ideas where truth is not hierarchical, but based on egalitarian uh, and inclusive standards where nations can come together to their own conclusions, right? So truth um, for many Indigenous folks is not relative, but it is relational, right? So a good way of putting it is that um, truth is our relative. And uh, Indigenous peoples have a lot of relatives, right? <laughs> so there are multiple truths, right? So how does Indigenous ontologies uh, onto epistemology support the, ne the, neg the ne negotiation of those truths, right? Um, and this uh, comes back to what Tall Bear works with uh, Donna Harway's work on situated knowledges, where Indigenous relations in story places challenge the power of objectivism and unified truth claims, right? And this is a big part of the problem of Western thought is that there's always this drive towards unit of truth, right? There's, there should be one truth, one God, one truth, you know, all these things, right? Um, and uh, Indigenous folks are very comfortable with living in the ambiguity of multiple truths because it's inside the, the relations, right? Um, so... This, this idea is about negotiating truth and knowledge with others through continued and continuous relatedness. So again, relations are super important to that knowledge, right? And um, Kim Talberg talks about this as terms of caring for the subject and that she says like, um, so in order to take care of the subject, so in order to be with a person, you cannot possess them. You cannot speak for them, right? She talks about standing with, right? which is a really beautiful sort of uh, a, a, a way of acknowledging indigenous sovereignty and self-determination in this nation, right? I'm not gonna speak for the Cree. You know, I'm gonna stand, I stand with the Cree because they are my relatives, right? And what does that mean? And you unpack that further, right? So really, how do you uh, be good relatives uh, while speaking about truth? I am running out of time here, so <laughs> I've got a few minutes here. So, so an aspect of um, 
of this work too is about like understanding that you know on, uh, uh, relationality is important. Onto epistemologies are also important, but we also have to understand how to live in these modern worlds and to recognize as modern thinkers, as contemporary thinkers, how indigenous folks are living as relational thinkers, right? And often the term hegemony comes up to describe the power of settler colonial discourse, but it's really something that we have to struggle against, right? Because what happens is that with the idea of hegemony is that we give our power to colonialism as indigenous folks, right? And we're not negotiating or navigating that um, those power dynamics, right? And uh, Siksika scholar, amazing Siksika scholar, as you probably know here, uh, uh, Leroy Little Bear talks about this jagged worldviews, right? You probably heard about jagged worldviews in his, his article. It's 20 years old. Um, he talks about this pre-colonized consciousness that flows into this colonized consciousness and there again. So this is a reality that Indigenous folks always have to deal with in terms of assimilation and negotiation of their relatives. But when we speak about hegemony and about power that way, we give power to colonialism, right? And we don't na navigate and negotiate them. We see this as a us versus them debate. And this is very, very difficult to sort of push back because colonialism is huge. It's everywhere, right? It takes up so much space. And as Indigenous folks living our true, our you know, relational truth in Batash or something, it's hard to speak uh, to speak loud enough to be heard by the din of settler colonialism. It is broad. It is Canada. It is the U.S. It is these power structures, right? So then, and then this way, um, these perspectives are um, what uh, are seen. So this us versus them perspective is seen as what. Uh, Maori scholar um, Brendan Hokuritu and Chris Anderson talk about as difference, right? The idea that uh, Indigenous folks, so to, to navigate and negotiate the power of colonialism, we just have to claim that we are different, right? And, um, and then this is something that Chris Anderson and Brendan, Chris and Brendan talk about sort of being like the problem that Indigenous studies faces is that to just be alive and be recognized in the academy, we have to claim difference to protect ourselves. And this is absolutely true. You know, we, Indigenous folks have to protect themselves from violence, right? And the violence that is still so real. But what happens is that in that creation of difference, right, is that uh, we end up being colonialism equals sameness and assimilation, and indigeneity equals difference and freedom. So then indigeneity becomes a question of authenticity, right? And then that is a whole can of worms. It's like, who are, who's more authentic indigenous person? Gray owl is, look at him. He's like feathers and, you know, buckskin and everything, you know? Not Maria Campbell. <laughs> You're like, okay, this is weird, right? So it's like, but this is what happens when you try to protect yourself and preserve yourself through these ideas of difference, right? So, um, and then what happens too with difference is that we end up asserting a pre-contact idealism. That's where authenticity comes from. You have to be pre-contact to be like authentically indigenous. That our ideas go way back, and it's true, they go way back, but that, that divorces ourselves from the contemporary. And this is where Chris talks about these ideas of exploding these binaries and focusing on like um, how difference gets in the way of relating. And that's a really important sort of thing to remember is that uh, when we talk about difference, it really gets in the way of us actually making kin together, you know? Oh, we're too different. Well, then how, how do you become related if you're different, right? So what is the articulation that we can look at that, right? So Chris, what he says is that, um, and this is, there's more to unpack in this, but um, Chris essentially says like these sort of binaries have to be sort of mitigated and shifted. We have to, what he says, explode these binaries into pieces, into like glitter uh, of these indigenous and colonial assimilation of difference, oppression, and freedom. These ideas of like, you know, difference and the thing, right? So what he argues instead, and this is an important theory, is this idea of density, right? And um, what he's arguing is that Indigenous relations is the baseline. We, we think in place through our spirituality and all these things. Um, and uh, we are also contemporary thinkers. Indigenous peoples are academics. Co community people are critical thinkers. And when we talk about difference, it, it sort of, it, it stops us from these conditions of possibility. This is what he calls, that we can use, you know, understand knowledge and stuff, use settler perspectives and ideas to, as tools to resist oppressive colonization and what we call an, an attempted hegemony, 
you know, the attempted sort of like power over indigenous folks. Indigenous folks are still here, you know, front row. We still pray, you know, in our own way, but we're still doing it today, right? I'm standing in front of you, right? Um, so this, so it's a way of mitigating that, uh, that hegemony, right? Um, and density really is about this idea that, um, that indigenous folks have inside their communities, inside all of what I've talked about, the capacity for engaging contemporary ways of thinking and knowing. Indigenous folks can use Foucault, can use Bourdieu, can use like, you know, Marxian philosophy, all these things, right? Um, indigenous folks are critical thinkers in community, right? We think through our relatives, right? Um, and then really this idea is that this, like that really is, those relations make us who we are as indigenous people, right? So, um, so in terms of the authority of living one's truth, so the authority of living one's truth or truth for indigenous folks lies in the density of collective indigenous nations living and thinking together. And that's really a great thing, especially if you're in university. University is such a lonely place. And I've been told by colleagues, like settler colleagues, by colleagues who are like, I didn't know indigenous peoples had epistemology, right? And it's just like, holy crow, that really put me off. I was like, I couldn't believe it, right? It's like, of course, indigenous peoples are thinking people, right? And I think Chris's idea of density in which hopefully I went deep enough, uh, says that like indigenous peoples have the capacity to think you know, creatively, critically, uh, using, you know, all sorts of ways of thinking and being annoying without possessiveness, right? And I think what, uh, instead, of, instead of talking about difference, we still have to talk about distinction, right? So thinking distinctively, right? So indigenous nations are distinct but relative. And that's an important uh, distinction, distinction to make, that like Chris says, right? Um, and these my kids up here. This is at the uh, Edmonton. You spotted my children. That's right. <laughs> They're super cute. Uh, this is at the Edmonton Art Park, uh, Indigenous Art Park, which is beautiful, right? And I think this is such an important sort of uh, a a physical, or, I'm sorry, a visual representation of Indigenous density, right? That our language, our Cree language, you know, our Michif language for us in Edmonton is still there. It's on the land. And my children are interacting with it physically, you know? So, very, and, I, and that's such a beautiful picture, right? Love those kids. They're always sick, by the way. So <laughs> they're at home being sick. Oh my God, more white hair for me. So a last component that I want to talk about is peoplehood, nationhood framework. So a lot of what we've talked about was like this sort of spiritual metaphysics, uh, metaphysics and self-determination. Um, but one thing is, and then the idea of that um, indigenous folks are always thinking together, you know, and, and not alone. But what we haven't talked about is what nationhood means, personhood means, right? Um, so, uh, because what happens is that we always think as, of individuals mostly, right? Um, so, uh, Eve Tuck speaks about, so Alouette uh, scholar Eve Tuck talks about personhood, right? And uh, the issue with personhood is that personhood from Western perspectives it represents this sort of like enlightenment value or enlightenment ideal that, uh, that representing the capacity, conditions, and means for people to think and to know and act and to be and sort of like engage, right? So. Descartes, I think, therefore I am, is, is an ideal of enlightenment personhood, right? But for indigenous peoples, we relate, therefore we are. So personhood is always uh, conditioned and at the intersections of our relations, right? Um, and again, this is like back to Tall Bear's work and Little Bear's work of understanding, like um, sort of focusing on the sort of like collective patterns instead of the individual patterns, right? So, um, and then T Tall Bear, I like this idea, Tall Bear, uh, not Tall Bear, Little Bear uh, speaks about like the sort of delineation of what is, what are these these groups, right? So he, he writes, several extended families combine into, if to form a band, several bands can form, uh, combine to form a tribe or a nation, several tribes can uh, uh, sort of combine to form a confederacy. This is a nicely nice delineation to understand indigenous relations as nations and stuff. So when we think about the Métis Nation, what are the, the, family bunches that come together to create these units, right? Instead of seeing it top down, we could see it bottom out, right? So the best way to understand personhood, indigenous personhood is always in terms of collectivity and therefore we talk about peoplehood, right? So this is um, a uh, the peoplehood matrix that was sort of designed by uh, a Cherokee scholar, Robert K. Tom Thomas, as well. Then it was adapted by Tom Holm, Diane Pearson, and Ben Chavez. But really, it's like how uh, communities intertwine and interpenetrate and interact, right? 
through all these different through language, sacred history, place, territory, and ceremonial cycles, right? And what's important to note about this thing is that it's related to place. This happens, this matrix, these relations happen in place, right? So, um, but the thing is that um, the issue that uh, the people, the reason why we call it a peoplehood matrix and not nationhood is that, again, there's too much baggage when it came to nation, right? The settler colonial state has too much baggage to really reflect what it means to be collective, to be community, you know, communities and stuff like that, to be related. So they chose personhood, they chose peoplehood over that, right? But Chris Anderson comes along and says, nope, <laughs> we should think about this differently. Again, it's the same thing that Shorter talked about, right? How do we think about spirituality and metaphysics differently? How do we think about nationhood differently? And he reminds us that nationhood is the reflection of the community, the tribe and the nation, right? And we cannot dismiss that because of colonial baggage. We, we, are, we are the Métis nation, right? And what I see is multiple homelands in which our family bunches related together in all these places, right? So the way he sees it is that, um, that the nation is a uh, sort of manifestation of peoplehood relations, not its replacement. So the way that he articulates it is that nationhood is imagining self as a sociopolitical kinship collectivity defined by through language, sacred history, place, territory, and ceremonial cycles. And peoplehood represents the external relations with other nations who are also in these peoplehood matrix relations, but is, which is driven by relationality, reciprocity, self-determination, and non-interference, as well as sovereignty and self-determination, right? And diplomacy. This is such an important thing to remember. What does indigenous nationhood mean? It doesn't represent statehood. It represents these kinship relations that bunch together through these ideas of that have a lot of religion and spiritual language to it to create these spaces that and they're always negotiating other peoples right they are two sides of the same coin right and there's a lot of debate either or but i really like chris's ideas we have to think in this way about indigenous nationhood or else we miss the point of what indigenous nations are like right oh then they're always in conflict with the state it's like no they want to make nation to nation relations with the state right so, um, and then in all this, it all, rep it, all this is that uh, one thing, sorry, the idea of nationhood too, we must remember that it is not anthropocentric. It is not human centric. Uh, all living beings in, have uh, the capacity for a personal, they have the capacity to be animate and have the capacity for personhood, nationhood, and people relations. So land, waters, plants, animals, they have the capacity for nationhood as well, right? Um, and therefore, to do that peoplehood relations, diplomacy is an important aspect, right? And that, again, has to do with ceremony and engagement like that. The like tobacco diplomacy, that's why we recognize territory, is because we want to recognize the Siksika here and the Métis here, the people who are making relations with each other in place, right? We always ask for the crown to recognize our nations, not because we are independent nations, because we want to make them into, re into relatives, right? In order to think and to be engaged, right? And, um, and really, it's a matter of understanding that, um, that nations are separate, right? We have to recognize the, the in like indigenous peoples as their nations, but related, right? Not possessed from each other, not engaged in that way, right? And all of this wonderful things, thank you for listening and not falling asleep. Oh my God, you guys are doing great. Um, I hope that this presentation on the hermeneutics of relationality gives you a direction and tools to support a critical engagement with Indigenous experiences and through this resist possessive logics that dominate settler society. And I hope it offers you a direction, in, direction on how to evaluate Indigenous relations to questions of religion and spirituality, to things about identity that you are thinking about all the time as Indigenous or non-Indigenous people, you know, how are relations informing your take and how are you seeing Indigenous peoples in this hermeneutics, right? Um, so, but in terms of like, I'll give you some advice or here, whatever, um, kinship relations and being good relatives are key to operationalizing critical Indigenous theory of religion, right? This must be done in ways that are not exploitative, extractive, appropriative, or paternalistic, right? To study indigenous religions is to be a good relatives, right? You cannot speak for indigenous nations and peoples, but you have to stand with your relatives. Um, but that takes a lot of time and effort and you have to show up, 
And I think that sometimes in our busy lives, we don't show up for our relatives in place, right? Um, this also takes a willingness for settler people and communities to divest from these discourses of, inter of institutional power and privilege and possessiveness. Possessiveness is really a dominant discourse in our way of being in, in Canada, U.S., and settler society. And that really is disruptive to good relations, you know? Um, so, uh, so then how do you make space for collective kinship relations that are consensual, self-determined, and situated based on an ethos of non-interference and diplomacy, right? How do you do that? How in your thinking are you doing that? How are you changing your minds about that? And uh, therefore, I think, so to talk about religion, which is something I haven't, I've been doing and not doing, which is really wonderful. Um, so to talk about religion is to make kin, right? So, um, therefore, to make kin means to move forward together as a distinct but related communities, nations and peoples, and the promotion of public and political understandings of indigenous relational knowledges. Marcy and hi, hi. 56, not bad. <laughs> Thank you. Shall I sit down? Uh, you can stay right there. I'm okay. just going to say a few things, and then it's probably good to talk into the mic so people mm -hmm. can hear your answers. But thank oh, you. Oh, you can see my sash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yay, very my nice. Sash. And your red shoelaces. And my red shoelaces yeah. and my white socks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. That was magnificent um, and inspirational. Um, I will give uh, people just a minute or two to absorb um, this wonderful talk as I invite uh, two of our student helpers to come down and to grab these two microphones that will enable us to take questions from the audience. And we have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes um, uh, to, uh, for questions. So, um, okay, so my question is quite basic. You touched on um, people pretending to be indigenous. Yes. And I know, like I see in the media, that there's a lot of upset around that. I feel that I don't understand it as well as I would like to. You mentioned possessive logic, perhaps, mm -hmm. and there's also this appropriation word. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can help understand a bit better. Yeah, so lately there's been a sort of like um, more of an outing of people who are not Indigenous pretending to be Indigenous. So the latest one is Buffy St. Marie, who we've, you know, people have loved Buffy since the 60s, right? She was on Sesame Street. Like, you know, like being an Indigenous person. And then there was a uh, W5 expose that, un, you know, outlined that she wasn't. And there's all of this, you know, fallback or sort of fallout from that, right? People who are sad or just, uh, you, know, you know, upset by the fact, like, why would she do this? What's going on? And it's funny that Buffy, that it's Buffy, whereas before we have uh, Carrie Barassa, who is from the University of Saskatchewan, who is a very important professor, who just invented her Indigenous identity. Right, just and there's a formula for it. Like, she, you know, she said she she claimed to be Métis. She claimed to be, you know, all these different sort of inclusive places, whatever. But what's at the center of that, and this is where to get more in depth is to follow Kim Talbert, love Kim, um, and her work on unpacking what, why there are so many pretendians or Fati out there today, right? Because in you know, in, you know, critical Indigenous scholars are out there pointing out that these people don't have relatives. You know, and there's a lot of logic that comes with DNA and blood. Like I have a Cherokee ancestor back in the day. You know, I have a Métis. I'm Métis because my I mixed my grandmother in the 1700s was was like was uh, Anishinaabeg in Montreal, whatever. There's a lot of racialized logics that sort of inform how why non-Indigenous people can become Indigenous. And they just slip into it because there's a possessive logics. There's no more Indigenous peoples anymore. I can speak for them. I am related to them through blood, you know? So all of these things are sort of end up being these institutional logics that have to do with possessiveness, right? That idea that I, I could just possess that identity, put it on like a costume and be it and believe it, like Grey Owl, right? He just believed it. Whereas real Indigenous folks were advocating what he was advocating, but no one was listening to them, right? So that's why it's an issue is that these that uh, like ray shifters are taking up places for real indigenous folks, but the reason they are is because other settlers see them as being real. Oh, that's what an authentic indigenous person looks like. 
Because again, it's these racialized logics and possessive logics that, in, that engage that. No? Yeah, so that's different from be people who've been disconnected and reconnecting through relations, you know, because of, you know, racist uh, policies for like the Indian Act and stuff. A lot of indigenous folks have been dispossessed of those relations, right? But people who've been, you know, the 60s scoop is, the millennial scoop is still something real. And a lot of people are reconnecting. But what happens is, is that the reason why me and Molly wrote this is that uh, a lot of sellers didn't understand what was going on, right? So we wanted to sort of conceptualize it in a usable framework to say, well, okay, so relationality is the framework. How, what, what, how are their stories? Who are their relatives? Who are they working with? Like, um, how are they, you know, the density of their relations today? You know, like bringing people today, not stuck in the past, and then focusing on nationhood and collectivity as being an important part of their identity. You know, like, um, like Grey Owl didn't have any relatives. He's, he lived alone in a cabin in the woods with one beaver. And I always felt bad for that beaver. He'd be like, beaver's like, I miss my family, beaver says, you know? And it's just like, I'm hoping that this relationality sort of like framework helps us understand that like, yeah, that beaver belongs to a collective, you know, who has their own stories, their own self-determination, you know? So, so this is just like, hopefully something that gives you sort of like a direction to sort of unpack those, that like my grandmother from 1700, from 1600s is, does not make me indigenous. Right, and I think also growing up as a French Canadian, you see a lot of that in the French Canadian community. Whereas, like, oh, my grandmother was this, so therefore I must be indigenous, right? And that's those possessive logics that are being deployed instead of being who are your relatives, who claims you, and who do you claim, right? So, yeah, hopefully that helps, eh? Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It was yes. so, so interesting. This is Wonder a lot of, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. This is a lot of what I'm working on. And something that I struggle with is like whether to use the term religion or onto epistemology when you're describing. Word. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it's just, uh, but it's, it's true because religion doesn't really capture the entire, you know, knowing and being that is indigenous knowledge is. So, I guess my question is, what is your advice on that if someone is struggling with whether to use the term religion, spirituality, or ontology and epistemology to yeah, describe no indigenous traditions of being? Holy, that's hard. Yeah, that's really hard because I struggle still today mm -hmm. with that. I'm, I've, been, I've been a student for 20 years now. It feels like forever. Again, gray hair on this. <laughs> it's coming up in my head. Um, yeah, and I've always struggled to unpack what religion means to Indigenous folks, right? I grew up as a Métis person in Batash, and we grew up, we were Catholics, right? Mm -hmm. But my mom's Catholicism is very different from my father's Catholicism. And I think I spent my whole life trying to understand that. You know, my mom's French-Canadian ways of being, and my dad's Métis, Métis ways of being, right? And I think I'm starting to understand my dad's Métis ways of being as kinship. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I am a co-organizer, co-organizer, they call us captains of the research project, which is really a really <laughs> thing to do. We're, uh, so me, Chantal Fiola at the University of Winnipeg, and Emily uh, Grafton from the University of Regina. We've done, we've just finished this amazing project we were, uh, where we went to visit in three Métis, historical Métis communities in Saint Laurent, Manitoba, in La Breton, Saskatchewan, and Saint Albert in Alberta. And we met with knowledge keepers and community members just to say, what does religion and spirituality mean to you? Mm -hmm. And what happens is that, and this is so funny, because we will fight tooth and nail to say, like, we were Catholic. No, we were traditional. Like, that di dynamic is like, holy cripes, you know? It's like, that's all we talk about. Like, we were this, that we were always this. But what I loved about our project, and we were visiting in very different homelands, right? We're still Machif people, but, like, we have Cree relatives up north mm -hmm. here. In Alberta, we have French relatives, we have Anishinaabe, Soto relatives, whatever. And what I loved about it is that it was always about kinship. And we never even defined religion. At one point, Selena, my, my knowledge keeper, is like, hey, you didn't, you didn't define religion. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. And so you caught me and I kind of like backed away. Oh, sorry, Selena. But it's like, I did that on purpose because religion has so much baggage. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that people were so happy to just visit together and to be seen for who they were in that place, 
-hmm. We went to Saint Laurent and we visited them there. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a pipe ceremony there. It was beautiful. Some people, you know, felt comfortable. Some people not. Mechef people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, at the end, we we went to visiting cemeteries. Like Métis loved to vacation in cemeteries. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. It's uh, we love it so much. Um, every place we went to, we went to the cemeteries, took pictures and stuff. We went to church, you know, and we had an homily by by our Métis, uh, one of our Métis knowledge. Uh, uh, Catholic Métis knowledge holders, but what was so important is that we were being seen as Métis people in our different ways. So for me, when you're talking about religion and spirituality, uh, knowledges, epistemologies, ontopistemologies, all these things, how does the community see kinship? How do they inform or define those ways of being through kin? You know, sometimes Christianity has been awful, a lot of times, have been awful to Indigenous folks, right? But in, that doesn't negate indigenous peoples being Christian. So how are they being Christian in their own way? How was my dad being a good Catholic in his own way? You know, he prayed the rosary every day with my grandmother's uh, wolf willow rosary that came from my grandpa Joe Jobin, you know, and he loved, he kissed it every day and he, because his mother did that. And he loved because he was praying for his ancestors all the time. My dad had a spiritual dedication to the genealogy like this, you know, who knew everybody. And that's another Métis thing you know a metaphysics right of metis ways of being so that's now i'm getting to understand my dad's ways of being so much more whereas before it was just like oh you're catholic therefore you are under the authority of the catholic church and you have to follow in all these things you know sometimes it is but i see it as the catholic church being a relative of the metis sometimes they're good sometimes they're bad but they're still our relative Therefore, we have to treat him like that, you know? So when the Pope showed up with a freaking sash, I was like, holy crow. I never thought I would see a Pope at Lac Saint Anne, this incredibly multi-nation, sacred place, wearing a sash of our nation. I was like, oh, man, that's amazing, right? So it's all about relations and then how do you navigate and negotiate that, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Does that happen to you? Okay, so less of a direct question and more, I was hoping you could speak to um, the same idea of like kingship and relationships, but when it comes to different types of greetings. Um, so for like an example, I am a school teacher and I work with a lot of like uh, minority and marginalized communities. And one of the big differences that I've noticed, especially when I started learning ASL, was the different way that they went about greeting people. It wasn't, hey, how are you? How's it going? It's, who do you know? <laughs> who are you friends with? Where did you get this information from? <laughs> Um, and so again, not a direct question, but I'm hoping, like, it seems so related to that concept. I was hoping you could speak to it for a minute. Definitely. Yeah. So indigenous folks are always like, who's your dad? Who's your cousin? Who's your, who's your relative? You know? And like, but then, so there's so much power in that question. So, so when I say that, so my wife is Chinese Vietnamese from Toronto, gorgeous, Lucy Liu. I love her. Been together for 25 years, just loving life. Um, but when I first met her, I was like, um, hey, where are you from? And she looks at me. What did you say to me? I'm like, uh, where are you from? She's like, where am I from? Where am I really from? I'm from Toronto, dude. You know, and I'm like, oh, 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 I stepped in something here because there's so much power as a white presenting person to be asking a woman of color, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Toronto. No, where are you really from? Oh, I'm from Vietnam, blah, blah. You know, like all these things. So it's taken a long time to unpack what that means for Indigenous folks. So when I introduce myself, just like, like uh, Doreen introduced herself, I introduce my relatives. And it's so powerful for Métis people to say, I'm a, I'm a Joman, I'm a Bremner, I'm a Taylor. And then people in the room will say, oh my God, we're related and we're making contemporary connections together right now, right? But you have to really understand where does that come from? It's like, I think there's a Cree concept of the Ochi sort of connection, your belly button connection. Right? It's like, who is your relative, right? So who are your ancestors? When I, because at one point, this was when I first, because I lived in Montreal and, and Ottawa for like 20 years in exile, where the city was on, a, was on an angle and I didn't know where North was, right, Al? So weird. Um, <laughs> um, when I came back, I was talking about my relatives. I'm like, my, my great ancestor um, was Margaret Taylor, na na na, of the fur trade. And then this, the, one of my students came back and Margaret Taylor was married to George Simpson, boo. He was like, he, uh, he merged the Northwest Company and the, uh, 
the other company, HBC. And when, when he did, he was like, I'm done with my Métis wives. And he kicked them out. And Margaret Taylor was one of these wives and another woman. And um, for us, it was just like, oh, my God, what a jerk. Um, but then this woman, uh, one of my students comes down. She goes, oh, my God, my ancestor was that other wife of George Simpson. And I was like, this is Edmonton, a library studies course, you know, in Native studies. And we just looked at each other like, holy crow. We remember those things, right? And that's what Indigenous, that's what that's all about. We know who we are because we remember. We go back to those sacred sites to remember. And Indigenous dispossession, the existential crisis of Indigenous of, of Indigenous dispossession is that forgetting and that forgetting only happens when we are not allowed to visit in safe places right you know why do we go back to pilgrimage like we're talking about Lac saint -Anne. I grew up next to a pilgrimage site called saint laurent near uh, Batoche I love that as a kid I loved it so much but now I understand why it's because it's a place where our ancestors are still there because they're living in our the memories of our people. We're praying for them all the time. We go back to Batash, we play fiddle, we dance, we eat fried food, <laughs> and uh, we go see the cemetery because we want to visit. Our ancestors are always there when we play the fiddle or when we have our sash. And these aren't, these are like white things, right? The sash or the fiddle. Like these are, this is an Orkney instrument or whatever, but that's our relative, you know? So that's why we greet each other that way to remember, you know? So. Well, am I talking too much? I'm so sorry. Jeez. Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Garo. Uh, first Call of me comment, Dr. Paul. Um, in, <laughs> um, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, there was a Catholic philosopher theologian, Franz von Bader, who also sought to critique Cartesian thought and said, uh, I am thought, therefore I am, meaning mm -hmm. also I am wanted, I am loved, therefore I am. Um, so helpful to your point as well. I like that. Um, That's so a question. So you talk about uh, relational logics, about hermeneutics, and then truth, which mm -hmm. in the Western tradition are very disembodied. Um, and so I'm curious what role the body has in your thought. Um, mm -hmm. So is there a logic of incarnation, something, a hermeneutics of the body, or when you talked in your third point about living the truth, um, is is the truth something we live or enact as opposed to something that we just think about? That is so much fun. I love visiting theologians or like theological questions because I did religious studies and I'm always imp impressed at the theological questions. I hope that you don't mind me talking about this in terms of theological questions. Because, um, so for me as a social scientist, it's always about social and political aspects of it. It's like, like how does it, how do relations inform identity? How do they form group connections and cohesion and, you know, all these things. But it's what I've talked, what I'm talking about here does land in people's bodies and, you know, um, in ways of understanding cosmology and like life after death and all these things. It's all sort of like intermeshed in this. Right. And, um, and I think there would be better people than me to sort of unpack what or smarter people or north or just like you know people to unpack what like indigenous different indigenous perspectives of the body and how thought intersects um with like what you're just saying right um and i would be so curious to see like a metis catholic understanding of like you know the body and relations and stuff um but there's a fun story that that Maria Campbell had put in a really fun book. I don't know if I can tell the story though. Maria never, never gave me the the reason. But there's a really great book um, written by uh, by GDI Gabriel Dumont Institution Institute of uh, road allowance stories. So the road allowance are the Métis who were dispossessed of land bases. Right? These are places Métis would go to places, be mobile, and land in these places. But what happened with colonial possessiveness? They took up all these spaces. And you couldn't land there safely anymore. So you become road allowance, right? Basically. And there's a lot of stories of these road allowances because this is places that Metis still related together, still told stories, still had knowledges, right? And uh, what's fun about this is that there's a story about old Arcan, this amazing fiddler, Metis, Mitch a fiddler with a beautiful mustache. And he's a gorgeous man, beautiful dark skin. And he ends up going to, to heaven. He dies. <laughs> and he goes to heaven and he meets up with Jesus, right? Right? 
So this is not my story to tell, and it's a beautiful story. I invite you to go to the GDI website, look at this story. It's amazing. Because what happens is that old Arcan goes up and he drinks with Jesus. Jesus is like so lonely. I'm so lonely. There's no, there's no one here. Uh, when the devil went to earth, he took all the, all the fiddles with him, and I only have harps. And so I've had this tune in my head forever. What? And then he was like, and Arkan's like, holy crow, this is, oh my God, I didn't know that. You know, this is fun, right? And um, what happens is that God, Jesus was so happy just to visit with old Arkan. He wanted to visit with him. He wanted to give him. And what happens is that old Arkan, you're not ready to die yet. You've got to take care of your kids. So he's like, okay, it sends him back to earth. But with that, he gives him that song that's in his head, right? And they call it Boshashu. La Boshashu, right? So it's Maria's story. It's beautiful. Um, it's, it's, the, it's that community story but what's important to note is that Jesus it cares about our nation he cares to visit he cares about our self-determination and things like that right so for me it's like inside like just like in your question about community every community has their reflections on the cosmology and knowledges and how it lands on us and we have to take those seriously you know and like and understand that the you know you know, like, we love to laugh, we love to dance, we love to fiddle, we love these things, we love to visit, right? So therefore, Jesus, in his way of being for us, is also reflecting those ideals, right? So, again, it's about kinship knowledge and how it lands in people, in communities, in collectivities, and how that gets expressed through stories, and the fiddle, and all these things. And the more you visit with people, showing up and visiting and listening, the better it is to sort of, like, take that knowledge seriously and like disseminating it and carrying it over. And just like my research projects, like that's what we did. We just visited and it was amazing. We were all so happy and that's all we had to do. It's like, it's almost too simple, you know? So, so hopefully it answered your question in a really not at all, but roundabout way. Huh? You can tell me more if you want. We've got uh, three hours here, right? <laughs> Okay, but I'm not a theologian, so I don't know anything other than like my own funny little Métis way of being. So, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, uh, please join me in thanking Paul Garo for your wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, creating a relationality and community here and for. Thank you for showing up um, and, and making that possible. And I'm grateful for the Calgary Public Library mm -hmm. for uh, hosting us in this, in this beautiful space uh, of diversity. And um, we're grateful for our amazing uh, student helpers, um, uh, Katie and uh, Diago yeah, and you. Josh, uh, thank you. Um, and uh, for George Frizzoco for his wonderful support and kind assistance, and uh, Monique uh, Rial, who I'd like to introduce, he's a Calgary MA student in the Department of Classics and Religion, because most of all, we would like to thank Elder Doreen Bergham for coming all this way with your beautiful blessing and, and acknowledgement. Thank you so much um, for that, and we'd like to gift you with a, a token of our appreciation for being here. Monique would like to say a few words. Yes. Well, thank you, Paul, <laughs> for driving so far <laughs> and sharing your knowledge with us. As a Macy person, I love to drive. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to country. <laughs> I love it. And Doreen, thank you for driving so far, too, for coming to be with us. Thank you for sharing your blessing and starting us off in a beautiful way um, and for grounding us with our ancestors before we spoke about Indigenous knowledges and ways of being today. So here's the blank. <laughs> Don't tell her what it is. <laughs>